Late at night, I am often searching through the Lost Media Wiki for new video topics. Lately, I find myself visiting the dark side of the website. Some of the topics there pique my interest, and I stay up late thinking about lost tapes. So today, I present to you, Lost Media That Keeps Me Up At Night. Siegfried and Roy, Tiger Attack. Siegfried and Roy are two magicians who are well known for their entertaining performances with white titers and lions. These shows are very fun to watch and usually everyone goes home remembering their favorite act. But on this night, everyone in attendance would go home with a very dark image in their head. On October 3rd in 2003, Siegfried and Roy began the show as usual. Less than one minute into the act, a white titer attacked Roy, dropping him to the ground. He sort of went down to, I think, get the leash. Now Roy, down on his haunches, had his back to Tony and Sandra. It happened so quick. It just happened so quick. The, the next thing, this, this tiger had him by the throat and just... It was like a rag doll. Steve Wynn says the video shows Roy falling backwards over the tiger's paw, and Montecor went for Roy's neck only after he was on the ground. The tiger sunk his teeth into Roy's neck and dragged him off the stage as everyone watched in horror. Finally, some crew members sprayed the white titer with a fire extinguisher. The titer ran away and Roy was laying on the floor bleeding badly from the attack. The magic show was immediately called off and Roy was rushed to the hospital. The magician suffered damage to his vocal cords. This entire disastrous event was filmed by the Mirage where it was being held. The Mirage Company confirmed this, however, they refused to release the footage out of respect for Roy. I wonder if anyone in the audience had a camera and recorded this attack. The, the Ren and Stimpy Adult, Adult Party cartoon, Life Sucks. Life Sucks is a Ren and Stimpy Adult Party cartoon episode that was almost finished but never aired due to the show's cancellation. If you don't remember, Ren and Stimpy the Adult Party cartoon was a spin-off slash continuation of Ren and Stimpy with more mature themes. It aired in 2003 on Spike TV. I remember watching this alongside Stripperella, peak 2000s television. While entertaining, the show had a very short run because it lacked the quality of the original cartoon. After airing only three episodes, Spike canceled the show leaving three that would never play on television. Luckily, all six episodes were released on DVD in 2006, so the three unaired episodes are not lost media. However, the episode we are going over today would have been the seventh episode created for this series. It begins with Ren and Stimpy in a garden. Stimpy is telling Ren that the world is full of happiness and trying to convince him that the world is a positive place. After the four minute mark, Ren rebuttals, telling Stimpy a dark story. It's about kids who are going to save the day. Stimpy asks, then what happened? Ren answers saying the kids walked until their shoes were out. Then some of them drowned. The rest of them went on to cross the mountains where they froze to death. Ren gets the idea to Stimpy that the world is filled with evil. Eight minutes of animatics and storyboard from this episode are available to watch online. We can see just how dark Life Sucks would have been. The creator of Ren and Stimpy has posted art and more of the storyboard online. So, there is most likely more of this episode locked away in archives somewhere. People who were working on this show said that it was written during the original Ren and Stimpy run, with most sources stating that Life Sucks could have possibly been the best episode ever created. Now, we'll never know. The Skyway Man
The Skyway Man is a documentary about doing stunts while flying. Created in 1920 by Fox Film Corporation, the movie features some crazy stunts but would be remembered for a much darker reason. On August 2nd, the crew decided to film a scene at nighttime using floodlights. This would help the airplane pilot and stuntman, former Locklear and Mitten Skeets Elliot, guide their way through the stunts. They instructed the crew members who were working the lights to shut them off once the plane got close to the ground. This stunt was supposed to simulate a plane crashing to the ground beside an oil well. Flares were attached to the wings of the plane so the pilots would go by that light once the floodlights were turned off. Unfortunately, the crew members didn't follow these important instructions and the floodlights were left on. Blinding the pilot's view, they didn't know how close to the ground they really were. The plane crashed into a sludge pool of the oil well, resulting in a fiery explosion, killing Locklear and Elliot. Stuntman Ulmer Locklear's girlfriend was watching the whole time as this took place. Her reaction was caught on tape. This, and the footage of the deadly crash, was included in the documentary, shocking audiences around the world. Over time, the documentary stopped being shown and became lost. As of today, no footage of the film is available to watch. A TV documentary about stunt films titled Hollywood, a celebration of the American silent film, was made in 1980 and one part focused on the Skyway Man. It shows a few pictures from that day and interviews with people who were connected to the documentary, including Ormer Locklear's wife. I was searching through YouTube for any possible footage from this documentary and came across a video titled 002, uploaded by Pat Locklear. In the video, we see plane stunts performed by Ormer Locklear. The one and only comment on the video is someone wondering if this footage is from the Skyway Man. This is possible, and seeing how the video is uploaded by someone named Pat Locklear, it only adds to the possibility. This is the only video on this channel, and there is no info in the about section. So for now, this one remains a mystery. Texas Chainsaw Master 2 Deleted Scenes The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 is the sequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This black comedy horror film was created in 1986 and was a hit with audiences everywhere. The movie gained a cult following. The plot of the film is very wild, and each crazy character is memorable. This depiction of the Chainsaw Massacre is horrifying. However, there is something fans of this classic horror film may not know. Many important plot points were removed from the movie, and this borderline ruined the story. Here's why. Canon, the company who distributed the film, forced the hand of director Toby Hooper, making him remove integral scenes that tell about the characters. In order to include as much bloody chainsaw scenes as possible, cinematographer Richard Corris worked on the film and commented on the deleted scene saying, quote, Cannon took over the cut, and if we'd shot anything with blood, gore, or chainsaws, they just threw it in, and in order to make it come to the proper length, they had to throw the story away. That's the real tragedy. End quote. Like any great movie, I'll give you the good news first. Most of the cut scenes were included as special features on some DVD releases but some of them have never been seen publicly and are now considered lost. The most notable lost scenes show that Stretch could have been the daughter of Lieutenant Lefty Enright. Another lost scene of Lefty Enright was of him hallucinating after eating a worm from a bottle of mezcal. During his trip, 
He sees chainsaws coming out of the walls while sitting in a hotel holding his gun. While filming the movie, a second crew and director was shooting footage and helping with ideas. The unknown director had a big hand in creating a scene of Leatherface and his family in an underground parking lot. They attacked someone, and this gory scene would have some amazing special effects done by none other than Tom Savini. Creator of the film, Toby Hooper, found a huge problem with the portrayal of special powers in this scene as Leatherface had the victims under some kind of spell. Hooper was furious at this decision, and he got rid of the second film crew, scrapping the entire scene from the movie. Luckily, this brutal scene was recovered and put on a DVD. The footage is of very low quality because it was left on the cutting room floor. All that can be seen of the hallucination scene is a picture still and a very brief video that was used in a TV promotion. Archiving footage that was not going to be used in the film was not a priority of canon, so the other lost scenes may be gone forever. Owen Hart's Fall Owen Hart was a Canadian professional wrestler and brother of wrestler Bret Hart. He was an amazing talent and worked for promotions all around the world. New Japan Pro Wrestling, Stampede Wrestling, WCW, and the WWF. Owen was very athletic and strong. His skill level was second to none. He was an idol for some of the best wrestlers to ever lace up a pair of boots, like Chris Jericho. From 1991 to 1999, Hart built up his wrestling career in the WWF by putting on some outstanding performances. But for some bizarre reason, someone backstage thought it would be a good idea to bring back his blue blazer gimmick. This is a time when people like Vince Russo were part of the creative team. Bringing back the Blue Blazer is a downright pathetic decision. Jim Ross said of this decision, quote, You got one of the top four or five wrestlers in the world, and you want to put him under a mask? An unknown mask, the Blue Blazer, didn't work. Bottom line is very simple. Creative couldn't find a better idea to utilize one of the best technical workers in the entire world. And I found that to be embarrassing. End quote. Owen did not like this character, but he did what he had to in order to build the life he wanted for his family. The Blue Blazer is a superhero, so if he was in a special match like a pay-per-view... His entrance consisted of him flying down to the ring from up above. On the night of May 23rd in 1999, at an over-the-edge pay-per-view, things went terribly wrong. The Blue Blazer was getting ready to make his superhero-like entrance in a match versus the Godfather for the Intercontinental Championship. Owen Hart was more than 80 feet above the ring, and when he jumped to the ring, the clip holding his weight broke loose, and Owen fell headfirst into the ring post. Jerry Lawler watched this happen, and tapped JR on the arm just as Owen was hitting the ring. Jim Ross said it sounded sick. Lawler's face went sheet white. Owen Hart did not survive this terrible accident. When this happened, the television screens went black. However, every fan in attendance seen this tragedy occur. The WWF made a bizarre decision to continue the show that night. Martha Hart, the widow of Owen, found out that the clip used to hold Owen's weight was meant for use with sailboats and it released under just six pounds of pressure. Complete negligence on the WWF's part, Martha would end up winning a wrongful death lawsuit for $18 million. Footage of anything to do with the Blue Blazer was cut out of future airings of Over the Edge. It's said that the footage of Owen's death was destroyed. Over the years, 
Fans have claimed to own recordings of the fall on home video. However, this has never been proved. Just like the Draws accident, this tape is believed to be locked up in a WWE vault somewhere with the instructions to never destroy, view, or duplicate. We can see pictures of Owen Hart after the accident while he was laying in the ring, but after searching around, I seen that someone commented a link on the Lost Media Wiki page that led me to Daily Motion. In this video, we can see the Blue Blazer promo that was playing on the Titantron as Owen prepared for his entrance. While the promo was playing, we can hear the impact of Owen's fall, along with the shock reactions of King and JR. The fan claims to have recorded every pay-per-view on VHS back in the day, and based off of the announcer's reactions, I tend to believe this is real. If you look around enough, the audio of the Spanish announcers reacting to the accident can be heard. Other than this, no other footage or audio is available of Owen's death. Cameras were rolling, so this lost tape does exist, but I'm not sure if it will ever see the light of day. I would like to say rest in peace to Mitten Skeets Elliot, Ormer Locklear, Siegfried and Roy, and Owen Hart. Hair Ribbon is a Mary Melodies cartoon that was first released in 1944. It centers around Bugs Bunny and a hound dog. Bugs Bunny torments the dog in different ways, driving him crazy. If you've ever watched cartoons from this era, then you know most of them consist of violence and controversial plot lines. Hair Ribbon is no different. At the end of the cartoon, the hound dog bites into a sandwich that has Bugs Bunny inside of it. Bugs Bunny then fakes his death. This leaves the hound dog feeling remorseful and he regrets what he has just done. He begins to cry and says that he should have been the one to die. Following this, Bugs Bunny immediately rises up and asks, Hey, do you mean it? Pulling out a revolver, putting it into the hound's mouth, and then pulling the trigger. Bugs then puts a flower on the dog's chest before dancing off screen. At the very end of the episode, the fourth wall is broken. As the hound dog says, this shouldn't even happen to a dog. When Bob Clampett turned in the episode, the censoring office found the ending very disturbing. They decided that the segment of Bugs Bunny putting a round in the hound dog's cranium was not acceptable. This ending was never shown on television. A bizarre decision was made and the new ending goes like this. When the dog starts crying and wishing he died instead of Bugs Bunny, Bugs pulls out the gun and this time offers it to the hound dog. The dog takes the gun and points it at his own head, committing suicide. Remember, this cartoon was created in the 1940s, so there wasn't a big focus on suicide like there is today. I guess this is how the alternate ending made it past censors. I still find it crazy that this made it to television. In 1956, the short was purchased by the AAP as it was included in the Warner Bros. cartoon catalog. From this point on, Hair Ribbon was aired with the ending completely removed. It was replaced with a shot of the hound dog laying down on the ground. The original ending was stored in Warner Bros. archives and was considered lost for almost 50 years. The episode containing the original ending was finally released in 1997 on a Laserdisc titled The Golden Age of Looney Tunes. However, Laserdiscs are very obscure and never caught on like DVDs. So, this release of the lost episode flew under the radar. Finally, in 2007, Looney Tunes fans could breathe a sigh of relief, as the original and alternate ending of Hair Ribbon was released on DVD on the Looney Tunes Golden Collection, putting this piece of lost media to rest. Rob Harris was known for sky surfing in the 90s, as he was the sky surfing world champion in 1994 and 1995. 
Mountain Dew wanted to use him for a commercial titled 007. During the commercial, Rob would wear a suit and jump out of a plane like James Bond, then use a parachute to land safely. When commercials like this are filmed, several takes are done in order to get the perfect shot. During one take, Rob jumped from the plane and his parachute lines got tangled. He wasn't able to deploy the parachute and fell 5,000 feet to his death. PepsiCo, who owns Mountain Dew, reached out to the parents of Rob Harris asking for permission to air the commercial. They responded saying Rob would have wanted it and his friends really look forward to seeing it and so do we now. The commercial aired and rumors began to spread around that the ad used footage from the deadly jump. This was debunked by people who were present on the day of filming. Even though this footage isn't from the fatal jump, it was still gut-wrenching for me to watch this, knowing that moments later things went terribly wrong. The footage of Rob Harris jumping to his death has never been discussed by PepsiCo or Rob Harris's family. This footage is lost, but because they were filming a commercial, we know 100% that his fall was filmed. On the positive side of things, the Rob Harris Foundation was created in memory of Rob, and there are many songs that are dedicated to his death. Brandon Bruce Lee was an actor and martial artist. He is the one and only son of Bruce Lee. He followed in his father's footsteps, training with Bruce Lee's students in martial arts. Brandon went to Emerson College and the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute to study acting, making his on-screen debut in 1986 in the film titled Kung Fu the Movie. Over the next few years, Lee would do a few movies and build up his image. Finally, in 1992, he landed an amazing lead role as Eric Graven in The Crow. As the crew were wrapping up filming the movie, tragedy struck just days before the film's completion. While doing a final scene, Brandon Lee was shot by a prop gun that misfired. A bullet casing was lodged in the barrel of the prop gun, and when a blank was fired, it pushed the bullet out at almost the same force as a live round. After getting shot in the scene, it was written for Brandon to fall forward, but instead he fell backwards. The director yelled cut, and the crew noticed that Lee didn't get up. Upon checking on him, they found he was unconscious and breathing heavily. Three minutes later, his pulse was gone. Despite several hours of emergency surgery in an attempt to revive him, there was nothing anyone could do. Brandon Lee was dead. The Crow was finished using stunt doubles and some CGI effects. It was a very successful movie, and I'm glad we can see Brandon Lee's final outstanding performance. The scene containing the fatal shot has never been seen publicly. It's been said that the director of The Crow demanded the tape of the accident be destroyed. However, more than one person who was on set said this isn't true. One person who worked on the movie claims to own a copy of the full film including Lee's death. Seeing as this is tied to a popular movie, I doubt this footage will ever see the light of day. The crocodile hunter Steve Irwin was a wildlife expert, environmentalist, and TV personality that is well known for his show The Crocodile Hunter. During this, Steve and his wife Terry rescue animals and explore wildlife. The Crocodile Hunter became the number one show on Animal Planet and Steve Irwin became a household name. On September 4th in 2006, Steve was filming for a new documentary series titled Ocean's Deadliest. While being filmed, he decided to go snorkeling in shallow water. Irwin began swimming alongside a stingray so he could get a video of it swimming away from him. Keep in mind that one of Steve Irwin's main rules for his camera crew was to never stop filming, no matter what happens. Steve Irwin began filming the very last scene for the day, and while swimming over the huge stingray, it reacted in defense to Steve's shadow, striking him in the chest more than a hundred times within a few seconds. Steve's right-hand man, Justin Lyons, recorded the whole thing and explained the accident, saying, 
After the attack, he filmed the Steenray swimming away, and when he panned the camera back to Steve, he seen him in a pool of blood. Erwin then stood up and said, It's punctured my lung. The crew got Steve back onto the yacht and seen he had a puncture wound over his heart that was leaking blood. As they were riding back to shore to get Steve to the hospital, the crew were saying positive things like, Think of your kids. Steve Irwin then looked up to Justin Lyons and calmly said, I'm dying. These were Steve's last words as he passed away seconds later. The video footage of Steve's death was given to authorities. It was then returned to the Irwin family and apparently destroyed. Over the years, a few terrible videos have popped up on YouTube titled, Steve Irwin Real Death Footage. Every one of these I watched are obviously fake, despite usually having over a million views. Three alleged screenshots from the video have surfaced online. After hearing the story, these look like they could be from the actual video, but this has never been confirmed. To me, this is similar to the Owen Hart fall video. It's a terrible accident, and we heard firsthand what happened, but the mystery element just makes you want to see the lost tapes. In conclusion of this video, I would like to say rest in peace to Brandon Lee, Steve Irwin, and Rob Harris. They all three seem like great people that left this earth too early. Hit that subscribe button for more Lost Media content, and until next time, stay up late productions.